Welcome to the one hour workshop. Um, topic is decentralization, setting up your own personal cloud, mail server, etc. in your own home. Uh, about myself, I'm Sven Neuhaus, I'm a software developer. I joined the Sovereign project two, three years ago when I, I had been running my own mail server for, I don't know, a decade or so. And uh, been struggling with uh, all the manual work and I came across this project and it had some really cool features and security faults and so on and I started contributing using it myself and that's how I got into that. I hope you do the same. Okay, let's get started. So this being officially a workshop, let me tell you it will take a lot more than one hour to go through all the steps if you try to follow it. So I will, I will just speed through it and then the idea is that you can look it up later on, your, on the slides. I just uh, uploaded them to the, to the website, to the conference website. Or you can just watch the stream and pause whenever you, you know, want to look, look something up. Um, also, while deploying it, uh, the software sometimes compiles stuff from source, and it's also supposed to run on really slow hardware, like a Raspberry Pi or something, so it will take almost an hour just to go through it. Yeah, so um, regarding the agenda, most of the slides will be talking about one aspect of the project is running it at home. The sovereign aspect is fairly automated, and I will be talking about that in the, in the later uh, half. But the first part is kind of manual at the moment. Um, the idea is if there is enough interest, we can try to automate it that as well and make it a smoother experience. Okay. And if you have questions that are urgent, feel free to ask right away, but I will also take, okay, take questions at the end. Okay, so I have this slide, why do you want to decentralize? I guess, I guess you guys all know why, but I can, I'm gladly uh, repeat all the arguments. Uh, of course, um, if you use a centralized service like, I don't know, Gmail or one of the many other things, um, it's super convenient, right? You get all these great anti-spam features, you get high availability, but on the other hand, um, you are the product because your data is making this service possible by be having it being analyzed and sold. Also, you don't know if they're gonna shut down the service, which is something that Google likes to do with some of their products on short notice. And, um, and you don't know who's, who's looking at it. All the companies are um, required by law to hand, out your, hand over your data if, if they get a subpoena and um, you don't know if they, they're not even allowed to tell you sometimes. So um, we know that we have old laws that protect our, our mail, like physical email letters and so on. But there, there isn't as strong as pro protection for, for, uh, for the digital uh, media. So the only way to make sure that no one accesses it without you noticing is taking control of your data yourself. Finally, um, d distributed denial of service attacks are real and they're not going away. So sure, it's easier to, to run a denial of service attack on, on a small home server but then again, the impact is also much smaller. It's only a few users that are affected, and hopefully that's not even a juicy target for the attackers. Also, if you get a uh, denial of service attack, you can talk to your ISP and, um, yeah. The, the, the guys running the attacks, they don't scale so easily if, if everyone has his own server. 
they would have to run a lot of attacks against all the people instead of huge attacks against a few juicy targets. Okay, so who should run his own personal cloud? So before I prepared this talk, I was under the impression that it was actually fairly easy. Um, but uh, I realized that you should have some basic knowledge about command line and networking. Um, so in case something is, goes wrong, it, it's great if you can troubleshoot it yourself. There's uh, the Sovereign project uses, uses GitHub and um, you can always open an issue there if you have a problem and maybe the documentation is not great enough or maybe it's an actual bug. Um, but once it's installed, it's actually fairly low maintenance. So you just update the packages and to get the security updates and then that's pretty much it. So it's, it's you know, halfway there between a turnkey solution and um, total manual setup. So the Sovereign Project is uh, initiated by a guy called Alex Payne in 2013. He was also fed up with Google and um, put up some um, some scripts with a tool called Ansible. I will talk about that later um, to automate the setup instead of having to you know write some instructions that you have to follow manually. And um, so the project has a lot of services and they have some really nice defaults with strong encryption and um, automatically generated Let's Encrypt certificates. Um, we have email, we have calendar, contacts, file sync, IRC bouncers, VPN service and some more stuff that I probably forgot. Uses Ansible. Ansible is an uh, open source project currently maintained by Red Hat. Um, the scripts for Ansible are called playbooks and they're written in, in YAML. It's actually really easy to understand. Just have a look at it. It's human readable. It uses indentation. Um, it's really straightforward and easy to pick up. I didn't know YAML uh, at all before I joined this project. so. <laughs> Just have a look at the files. So it should be fairly self-explanatory. So the next question is, um, where, d where do you want to run your uh, personal server? Um, my advice would be don't use a virtual private server. Those are the cheapest. You can rent them from the INSP, but they're only virtual. So actually, you're sharing a part of a of a bigger server and you can't really tell if someone is looking over your shoulder, copying your files, modifying them, running tasks. It's totally unnoticeable for you. So virtual private servers are not good. So a dedicated server is the way to go, physical hardware. But those are kind of expensive. And also, let's say you rent a dedicated server at an ISP and you can do full disk encryption. So even if it gets, you know, examined, they can't get your data. But what if it suddenly reboots? You know, you don't know why did it reboot? Did, did they clone the hard drive? Did they put a backdoor in? So next time I log, log in to unlock the full disk encryption, you could be compromised and all your data is gone anyway. So ideally, you would have the dedicated server at home. Um, Let's talk about that in more detail. So if it's at home, you will usually notice if there's unauthorized access. You know, if someone breaks into your home, you t tend to notice that. Um, you can still use encryption. Sovereign uses uh, uh, encryption for the data stuff, like emails and so on. You can use that. You can turn it off and instead use full disk encryption, or you just, I don't know, put it in a safe and don't use encryption, maybe because you need to save for some, uh, the, the speed. Um, backups are 
easy when it's at home, you know, you can just say, okay, I'm gonna shut down my personal cloud now and uh, do a backup, full, full backup or sync to your own NAS at home, maybe you have one, or you can also use the, the standard solution provided by Sovereign, which is Tarsnap, uh, Tarsnap, but it, it's a commercial product, so maybe you want to build your own stuff. Um, okay, should be a low power device, so it doesn't get your big phone bill, uh, I mean electricity bill, and uh, doesn't make a lot of noise and so on. I recommend to get something with one megabyte of RAM, but it will probably work with half a megabyte also. Um, in my example, I'm using a Raspberry Pi 3. And then the problem is hosting at home means you have a, a dial-up IP. Like if you have DSL or maybe you have cable internet, you have a, you are considered a dial-up user uh, in terms of um, real-time black hole lists. So uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but spammers, they, when they, they like, I mean, when they hack home users, they abuse their machines to send a lot of spam, and that means those types of IP addresses from home users are usually put on these blacklists that you can use, that Sovereign also uses, uh, to protect your mail server from spam. So if you have a, like a home IP, it will not be a good experience to run a mail server because your mail, if you send mail, it will be rejected a lot, you know. So you want a real IP address. And the way to get that is to use a dedicated IP VPN. A VPN, a virtual private network. Um, I guess you guys all know that. The difference here is that you, you're the only guy with this IP and you always get the same IP when you connect to the VPN. I mean, in this case, it will be a permanent connection anyway. So these types of um, VPNs are expensive, like 10 euros a month or more, maybe even 20. So um, instead of using an expensive service, I would recommend that you just use a VPS. Uh, you don't really have to trust it that much. You can consider it part of the hostile internet. And VPS are really cheap. Um, I looked around for some super cheap options and you just, this is not an endorsement or anything, but you can get them for like less than $6 a year or something, yeah. So um, there's a <coughs> nice forum, low end, low end talk, where you can always find offers for super cheap VPS services. And you just need, you know, like 64 megabytes of RAM and you don't need a lot of disk space. Ideally, it will be a faster connection than your home internet. Um, but, you know, for email, it's probably not that critical anyway. So, yeah, use it for outbound and in inbound, both. So, let me show you the, uh, talk you through the network setup. So, um, in the lower half, you, you, we have the home network, that which, which is behind the home router, which has private IP addresses, and this thing called Homebox. That's where the private cloud will run on. And um, so the green arrow, the dotted line, is the, the virtual, the VPN. And the, the VPS running in, on the evil internet is providing its IP address to your Homebox. Is that clear so far? Okay. <coughs> okay, now um, let's talk about the VPN configuration. So for my purposes, I use the, um, most VPSs these days, you can choose Debian or Ubuntu or some other distributions, but Ubuntu is nice, has five years of updates, so I, I, I use that for the VPS. Um, I use the OpenVPN repository, so I get a nice recent version of OpenVPN, which has all the latest security enhancements and ciphers and so on. Um, you can install it like that. And then there are quite a few steps. Um, I will go through them. I have to speed up a bit, I noticed. So if you don't, you don't have to, um, you know, look at everything in detail because it will be too much details anyway, but um, 
can look it up later. So for OpenVPN, we become our own certificate authority, which sounds complicated, but there is a set of scripts that makes it super easy. Um, basically, you just run those commands, and that means you created your own certificate authority, created a certificate for your for the server running on the VPS, and for the client which runs on the home box, which will be running the sovereign stuff. And then um, we create the server configuration. This is. It uh, uses the files we generated on the previous slide using the scripts. Uh, you copy those to the um, etc open VPN directory. And that's, this is the first part of the configuration, and this is the second part. Uh, it uses some nice, strong crypto. You can also switch to elliptic curve if you prefer that. Um, the latest version of OpenVPN has this new option. NC NCP ciphers, which provides a fallback. Um, so it will try to use the latest, greatest, and if it can't, then it goes back to ciphers. And this is the client configuration. It uses this uh, inline format. So um, basically where it says contents off, then you insert this the file you generated earlier. OK, you have to put in your real IP address there. I guess I left mine in there. Um, yeah, this is the second half. We also generate our own Diffie-Hellman parameters. There were some attacks being suggested. Uh, yeah, there was the idea that the NSA uh, did a prime factor analysis on the on the 1024-bit uh, Diffie-Hellman. So this can going back a uh, few slides. This uh, build DH it can take uh, several minutes maybe even 10 minutes or so on on a this, on this small machine like a Raspberry Pi. So just leave it running for a while. OK, then we have the configuration file for the server and the client. Um, we need to do some, some more steps to get it started. There's a file that EDC default OpenVPN where you configure which, which VPNs you want to start. And then once you do that, you can try to start it, check the syslog that it's working all right, enable IP forwarding. And then on the client side, you the file we just generated with the, all the inline stuff, you, co you copy to your, to your Raspberry Pi or whatever, uh, home box via SSH. Um, so the idea is I used uh, like Raspbian on the home box, which is pretty much Debian. You can use, with Sovereign, you can use either Debian or Ubuntu. So I did basically the same thing for, um, for the client. Also, I used the latest repository. <coughs> I had to add the signing keys for that and install the 2.4 version of OpenVPN on the client. OK. Um, yeah, I think maybe, maybe they, either there's something missing there, how to start the service, but or maybe it will come later, but I can, if not, I can tell you later. But it's uh, using system CTL. Okay, so before we can um, do the sovereign installation, we do need to make sure that we have all the DNS records for all the services you want to run. So if you have turned on everything, it will be this list of services. But as I said, you can also disable whatever you want. Maybe you just want email. Then you just don't need the rest, basically. But I mean, usually if the machine is running anyway, it's nice to have some other stuff on it. So um, you need a domain of your own, and you need to create A records. This is also 
described in detail in the sovereign documentation for email. You also need a MX record. Um, usually, if you have a domain, you get a like the most registers offer the ability to edit your to use their uh, DNS service and edit the records there. That's probably the best idea. But if you have two machines, you can also run your own DNS service. But that's probably not so good for the if you have never done that before. Um, so around um, so Ren uses Postfix as the mail transfer agent, uh, Dovecot as the IMAP server, and Roundcube as the webmail, which is like what we have here from. And that's all reachable under mail dot your domain name. Okay, so and remember the the diagram I showed earlier. We want to provide the IP address of the VPS to the server to the homebox. So the idea is um, forward everything that hits the VPS to the home box, except, of course, SSH, so we can still configure the home box, uh, the, the VPS, sorry. And also, um, yeah, to understand this, you need to know that on, on the particular VPS I was using, the Ethernet interface was called ENO1. Um, <coughs> OpenVPN creates a configuration file, uh, a status file called openvpn status.log, and we grab the IP address from the other side from that, and then we use that to, to set up the firewall. Um, any questions about this? Because it's not done yet. So it's, this is not the typical setup. But the idea is to create like a separate playbook to do this automated also. Yeah. OK, regarding the actual sovereign installation, there's, uh, there's a nice readme. You should really check it out. Um, so sovereign provides also an, a VPN server. But in this case, it will. there is a potential conflict with it being a VPN client also, so I would recommend to comment it out for now. Also, maybe it's uh, if you want if you want to use a VPN service, maybe it's a good idea that you use the VPS for that because um, it will be usually have a faster <coughs> internet connection. So if you just if you're just on a, in an internet cafe and you want you know you don't know if there are any people messing with your traffic or maybe in a hotel or something, you can use your your VPN to get the traffic to the VPS and then go into the internet from there. Um, yeah, one point uh, I would, so you should comment out all the unwanted roles and one of them being VPN in this case. Um, Tarsnap, I mentioned that it's, it's optional. Um, also comment that out and then you basically run Ansible playbook. <coughs> And then you have the host file where you put the IP address of, of the VPS in there, and then the site YML file. And if you run into some errors or want to do some changes later on, you can always run it again and again. In fact, like that's the standard method. If you also, if you want to add a user, like an, another email <coughs> user, you put it into configuration, run it again. You can also use some. Um, some web front end but it's uh, to administrate the user accounts and so on but it's currently not part of of sovereign um, there are some sovereign uses the standard database layout for virtual domains and virtual users and so on so the available tools there are tons of them they usually work okay and then there's also a wiki on, on GitHub on, as part of the Sovereign project, which has some nice um, instructions how to configure like mobile apps if you want, like push email, um, yeah, stuff like that. I can show you what it looks like if it's running. One, one second.
So this will be faster than real time because it already ran before, and you can tell if it if it found any changes, then it will be yellow. Otherwise, it will be green. So I have a Raspberry Pi in the tent over there. I hope it's still running. <laughs> <coughs> Looks okay. So as I mentioned, this will run for a while, and um, hopefully you get no errors. If you get an error, just look at it, maybe make some changes, maybe file a bug report, and then run it again. Okay, um, so maintenance, maintenance is actually quite nice. You get, an, you get some nightly reports via email, uh, log watch, you also get notified if your, if your uh, server appears on a black hole list. So you can know maybe, you know, one of my, like, for me personally, I use it for my family also. So maybe one of my family members got hacked and someone is using their account to send spam. And then you will usually, one or two days later, you end up on the black hole list. And then you can find out what, what went wrong and then contact the black hole list to get removed again. That way your, your email is still deliverable. Um, you should definitely do a backup. So um, I personally created my own solution for that. If you have a NAS, it's probably a good idea to do it that way. Or, you know, in, in, the, in the case of a Raspberry Pi, if you just have a big SD card, you can, can probably do a snapshot of it every now and then. Um, user management tools, I mentioned those. Um, the one I use is called VEA. It's super simple. It's, it doesn't have, uh, it has only like one, one master user and you should definitely put it in a password protected area. But it's, it's nice and easy to use. Any questions so far? Yeah. No, but I, I, I mean, last time I uh, changed internet providers, I uh, had a server that was already on a black hole list. So before I even started, I checked it and then I contacted them and had, had it removed. So especially if you have like ISPs which are have really cheap servers, they often get abused also. So maybe their even their whole subnet is on a blacklist. But in, in my case, I was able to get an exception for a single IP. Sometimes also the ISP can help you with that, you know, getting removed from a black hole list. Where do you check? Pardon? Where do you check um, I don't have the URL ready, uh, handy, but uh, you can Google for that. <laughs> yeah, you know, check RBL, so the abbreviation is RBL. Check RBL and then, you know, also, you, you will find out really quick because uh, you will send an email and then it will be rejected. So you will get a bounce and then it will say in the, in the reason for the bounce that, no, I don't like you, you're an RBL. And it usually contains a link where you can fix it and where you can get yourself removed. Um, 
Yes, uh, so the question is, why did I use the inline format for the client? Yeah. Well, the reason is just, um, I also use it for for other clients, and it's easy if you like have, an, I don't know, a mobile phone, then you have to just give people one single file with everything in it. Yeah. So also in this case, it, you just have one file copied to the ETC OpenVPN uh, directory. You could also uh, do it the same way as the server configuration with the individual files, that, that also works. So it's just a convenient thing, but it, you don't have to do it that way. Okay, I'm kind of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, nowadays I would probably switch to Nextcloud, but um, we haven't had a volunteer to, to do that change, so. If you have a Raspberry Pi 3, it's okay, you know, it depends on what your requirements are, but if you just want to use sync your calendar and your contacts, it's perfectly fine, you know. Why do you <coughs> get own clouds for the next cloud? What is behind that? It's just my personal impression that next cloud is, um, so it's a fork of open, own cloud, and I've been to some conferences, and it seems that there's more development going on, more support right now. Okay. But maybe they will merge again also. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, so, yes, I will take more questions, sorry. sorry. So Sovereign um, is always low on volunteers, so we need some more people to take care of bug reports, patches, patches and documentation. I mean, there is a lot of documentation already, but you can, always, you can never have enough documentation, right? Um, yeah. So please consider if, if it's useful for you and maybe you find some bugs or whatever, you will notice how easy it is to make some changes, head in a pull request, and then once you've done that a few times, maybe become a team member or whatever. Um, I would love to see that. Okay. Now we are at the official questions part. You had one. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to be able to search in uh, Microsoft uh, documents and PDFs from my mail client. Okay. The question is searching Microsoft documents from the mail client. And PDFs. And PDFs. Um, so we have some uh, full text search support um, for, for mail, but I don't know if it actually searches attachments also. So you would have to check. I, I can't answer that. I'm, yeah. Sorry. How easy is it to integrate with other devices and with Android smartphones and Facebook, etc.? Is it easy to integrate? Yeah. So the question is how easy is it, in, is it to integrate with other devices? So in, in case of uh, email, you know, you have Let's Encrypt certificates, everything will just work. Basically, you can use push emails um, on on Android and on iOS. And um, for OwnCloud, you have the OwnCloud app. Mm. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, so OwnCloud is, uh, offers uh, contact and calendar and file sharing and probably some a lot of other stuff that I uh, like. Uh, image gallery if you want to do photo sharing so that but you can use the built-in contact sync and calendar sync for in your phone in your android phone or iphone to sync your contacts and your calendars exactly so Yeah. I think so. Yes, I I haven't used it myself with the automatic sync, 
but maybe someone can answer that. Yeah. Yeah, also for the desktop? Okay. So, yes, definitely. Especially with Dropbox being a US company, so we don't ex expect any data protection there. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I've, I've looked at isn't but BitTorrent Sync isn't open source, I think, right? It's, it's it's pretty cool tech, but unfortunately, you know, kind of proprietary. Yeah. Okay, one more question. I mean. Could you? What was it after Debian? So the official supported uh, distributions are Debian and Ubuntu. If you have anything else, it will probably take some effort to get it adapted. But um, you know, if you're willing to support it for a while, please send pull requests. You know, so we support the um, Debian Jesse right now and Stretch. I read that it only requires some minor changes. There is an open issue for that, so it's not yet merged. But um, it's like three package names changes. Um, three packages changed their name, as far as I'm, I'm aware. So it runs also. Yeah. So the question is, how easy it, is it to change components? So we've had quite a few uh, situations where people preferred, like, instead of running own cloud, they want to use, I don't know, um, Radical or something uh, uh, to sync their contacts. So you, the, you can do that. You know, you can ch disable the service you don't want and then manually configure the stuff you want instead. And ideally, um, create an Ansible configuration for it so other people can use it also, you know. And then there's no um, ideologic. I mean, there's a discussion usually in, in GitHub issues. I mean, of course, it, we are already low on volunteers. So having more variants that do the same thing, unless there's people who are committed to supporting it, we may have second thoughts about that. But if you say, OK, I'm, I'm running this myself. This works well, please. Merge this. We'll surely do it. In the back. Yeah, the question is does it support multiple domains and virtual users? Yes, it does. Yeah. So it has this uh, normal postfix database backup uh, backed service with PostgreSQL. Yeah. How does the question is, how does Sovereign compare to the Debian Freedom Box project? I don't know, really. I haven't used anything else in the la lately. Um, maybe someone else has some experiences and can t say something about that. OK. Sorry, I don't know. Please let me know if you. Uh, this guy's first, sorry. Yeah, so. Um, the official way is to use Tarsnap, which is an open source encrypted cloud backup, basically. But it's also a commercial service. So I um, created just some script that writes, runs every night and encrypts the stuff and and pushes it to some cloud space I have. But it does like encryption before it pushes it. But if you have it in your home, it's also and you have a NAS, you can just usually um, like network attached storage, they always have a backup solution. You can use that. And since they run Linux themselves, it's that's true. And if it, as long as it's all in your own home, you may want to have a solution to do, I don't know, a weekly backup or decentralized backup, you know. OK, the next question. That's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is. Yeah, 
Okay, so the question is about availability. Being at home, you may not have a UPS or it's not server grade hardware, not as available. So maybe there's an idea for distributed cloud solution with some friends or something like that. Sounds cool. <laughs> Bring it on. Uh, there's nothing that I'm aware of. There is, however, um, some other talk I want to mention about running stuff in the cloud, even if you don't trust the cloud, like searching encrypted cloud stuff. Um, I don't know the title of the talk, but uh, I hope it, I thought I had it somewhere in my notes. No? So I can leave this on. This is the URL of the site. Um, yes, by Erica. Yeah. Can you repeat the title? My safe in your house. Yeah, my safe in your house. I think it's today in two hours or so. So check that out also. Um, yes, it runs Apache. It does not run MySQL right now because we try to have only one database with with a memory requirement. But you can definitely uh, put your own stuff on, put your own web pages there. Also, if you have a nice upstream, upstream connection at home, you can go wild here. Definitely. You were saying that you were running a Raspberry Pi as a megabyte of RAM. No, it's a Raspberry Pi 3. It has one gigabyte of RAM. Yeah. Uh, so the question was if, if it's a Raspberry Pi. Okay. So the question is automatic updates. You can either, uh, I mean, you can use the mechanism provided by your distribution, like for for Debian and for Ubuntu, you can use automatic upgrades for for security updates and do the rest manually. Or you can, I tend to log in manually and do it by myself, but yeah, you can automate that also. Okay, any more questions? Ah, oh, they're in the back. Yeah. Do you have any examples of uh, that that is also possible when you store your data at home? Okay, so the question is if you store your data in the cloud, you may not notice it being accessed by the government or anything. Can this also happen when you're at home? So, depending, uh, so there are several things here. So, your server could get hacked by the government. You know, they're entitled to do that now. So, we try to make it secure. Also, with the VPS solution, you can um, make it slightly more secure by only forwarding those ports that you actually have open. Right now, it forwards all the ports. So, this, you know, may, maybe you want to consider that. Also, they can physically break into your house and try to do it in a stealthy manner. Is this what you're getting at? I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, so it's a server running in your own house. Uh, if they can get in via the internet, then you have, a, of course, your data could be copied or even modified, whatever. Yeah. So the question is, can they force you to decrypt your own data? Yeah, it depends on the country. I mean, there's there's a guy in jail in the U.S. right now because he doesn't reveal his encrypt, encryption key. Yeah. So, but that's only in the U.S. I haven't heard that in Europe. I think in, in the U.K. they are also going that way. So some people have been, you know, I think the the te technical thing is like disrespect of the of the judge or something. Contempt of court. Thank you. Um, but this is actually something that we should fight against. You know, as I said, there are strong protections for for written letters. And I don't see any reason whatsoever that it doesn't extend to digital data. You know, there shouldn't be any difference, right? Yeah, because that would totally circumvent that law of the written letter. Yeah. And also there, there are laws, in theory, protecting data while it's in transit. But there are so many exceptions. Uh, in Germany, there's the G10. And, you know, everything's pretty bad. Uh, the 
Yes. So the VPS server could be, uh, you know, backdoored, whatever. It doesn't really matter that much. I mean, we consider the internet to be hostile anyway. So the VPS is part of that. And of course, if they um, get right to the VPS, that means they can capture all your traffic. But, you know, ideally all of it is encrypted anyway. So if you retrieve your email using uh, email client, it will be encrypted. If you send email using SMTP, it will be, at least it will be transport encrypted. And also, Sovereign has some nice defaults, so if it talks to other mail servers, it will use opportunistic encryption whenever available. And if you, d if you don't know if it, opportunistic encryption will be used, or maybe you're afraid of some SSL stripping, yeah, then you can always use end-to-end -end encryption also. Okay. One more question. Do you recommend putting your VPS in a country with strict laws to privacy, like Switzerland or Sweden? Yeah, it's probably a good idea. You know, I mean, the first, um, you can go two different routes, basically. You can either go the performance route, which means you put the, you choose a VPS that is close to your, has a good con network connection to your physical server. So there's not a lot of extra round trip time for the request. Or you say, you know, I want to have it in different countries. But being that the fact that the VPS is rather, there's a low amount of trust in the VPS, it's not that critical, really. You can also go for the cheapest one. 